Thank you also for the invitation. We're really uh, excited to be here at Rice. We uh, have always had a not so secret fascination for Texas, and we always enjoy coming uh, back and using the air conditioning, although today it's pretty good. Um, we call the lecture 20 Work in CO9, which is not you know, particularly interesting uh, title, except for the fact that um, I guess 09 was a, uh, a brutal break uh, for much of the world, and I would say uh, in particular for architects and, uh, and building in general. And so we wanted to um, take this opportunity to reflect on this past year um, and reflect on our thinking for this past year. Um, the cliche or goes that uh, in times of recession, uh, actually artificial thinking flourishes and it's the moment of stepping back uh, from the sort of hectic uh, um, commissions, etc., uh, to uh, reflect on uh, where to go and uh, propose uh, sort of very uh, utopian-like uh, conditions. Um, this image is one that we did uh, for New York Magazine for the BAM Cultural uh, Art Cultural Dis District uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, we were the master planners for the district and uh, it was very interesting because it really, um, throughout the years, as the boom got more and more booming, uh, it turned from a program of uh, uh, culture and middle income housing to sort of uh, the private plazas and condo buildings. Uh, now the project is in Tanyang Hall, and we were asked to do just a, an image for it. And so we proposed to hijack uh, stimulus money for highways, um, and then use that to create a kind of very interesting loop of, uh, of art and culture finally back in the space. So this is a little bit the tone uh, of the lecture. Um, so um, we wanted to, we took the time to uh, to look back at uh, previous times uh, of thinking and uh, reevaluating, and in generally uh, sort of time of sort of visionary thinking, the 60s, of course, uh, were maybe uh, the last big one. But uh, looking at visionary thinking through contemporary a contemporary lens, uh, with the contemporary issues that we face today globally, uh, the massive urbanization. Uh, that's occurring uh, almost everywhere. Um, this is an image of Dubai. Um, and uh, looking at consequences of that on the environment and sort of bringing a more contemporary uh, um, um, sort of uh, preoccupations to that notion of, of the visionary and the ability to project again. And so the tension really is between, let's say, these two books, which are uh, certainly not literary uh, gems, but are quite interesting in their content and positioning it as sort of populist books. Um, Ecotopia, written by Ernest Kahneman in the 70s, is the story of the Northeast seceding from the rest of the US to found its own uh, sort of ecotopia, a sort of a state that's really completely different, uh, very much engaged in uh, being one with, uh, with nature, and it's got very interesting socialist uh, um, sort of attitude mixed with 70s counterculture attitudes, etc. And this sort of uh, attitude uh, sort of contrasted with uh, another uh, sort of populist book, which is called X Save the World, uh, Cow Generation X Got the Shaft But Can Still Keep Everything from Sucking. Uh, where uh, Jeff Gordon uh, goes through a number of sort of Gen Xers who are um, trying to uh, provide change, uh, but without the necessary uh, kind of radical utopian positioning and kind of much more uh, specific and localized interventions. Uh, in particular, when it comes to architecture, he mentions Cameron Saint Clair, and a more interesting example for us is, is Fritz Lee. <coughs> which I'll show an image of later on. So it's this kind of tension between how do you read, read the visionary through our, um, our tools and our mind today? And how do you move beyond uh, the typical uh, sort of opposition between Robert Moses, who, you know, uh, I'm sure all of you know Moses, even a big, 
powerful infrastructural gestures, destroying urban fabric, uh, and Jane Jacobs, the grassroots uh, uh, defender of, of life in the city and the street. And so moving beyond that opposition to try to find uh, new ways of, of, of thinking about how to live um, today. Finally, uh, as always, uh, architecture and architects look outside of architecture, and in particular, we've been recently influenced by uh, Michael Pollan's writing. This is Omnivore's Dilemma, who uh, for us is a fascinating thinker today uh, in the way that he can analyze uh, school systems uh, with, with such scale and such specificity and such precision. Uh, and um, it's a great inspiration for us, kind of leave the things to the large scale and then zooms in on the small scale at the same time. And so the question is, at what, at what scale does one operate to, uh, to project uh, uh, new or other ways? Uh, do you operate at the downtown scale of an entire new ecological city? Or do you operate, uh, and or do you operate um, at a much more specific localized scale, which then is made much bigger through media. This is uh, one of Fritz Haig's installation for, as part of his uh, <coughs> transforming suburban lawns across the country into um, edible uh, gardens uh, and productive gardens. And so it is this um, sort of thinking This year, that took us to, um, you know, reread um, sort of like I said, visionary projects through a contemporary um, lens, in particular a contemporary lens with environmental concerns that we developed for New York City, where we examined um, <coughs> 49 visionary projects, um, and then uh, it's very difficult to uh, remove their ideology, but at least try to flatten them and quantify them, uh, to assess them in, in a new and different way, uh, trying to find a kind of new entry into them. And so um, all of the uh, projects were redrawn to the same scale, to have a sense of you know, what the proposal really uh, entailed. Um, this is a timeline of the 49 cities that we uh, looked at, and it's quite interesting. It really, um, um, across time, architects and urbanists have been about the city. And then there's this kind of big um, uh, activity around the um, starting of the 50s and then sort of ending in the 70s. <coughs> this is the fear timeline, which is another way that we organized all of these visionary projects. The idea was that um, um, all of these proposals were often, if not always, a reaction to something negative, something to escape, um, whether it's uh, waste or slums or sprawl today, etc. Um, we organize them according to uh, uh, the fear factor, as I said, according to form, whether they're linear, gridded, radial, or irregular. We uh, ran, uh, looked at whether they were realized or not, if they were flexible and extendable or not. And we were able to look at um, uh, quantify sort of infrastructure, housing, um, as well as kind of relationship between the built and the unbuilt. The unbuilt being the green, where we sort of divided into long agricultural land, um, um, wilderness, and, and sort of parks. So just a few cities, um, all of the cities are organized, uh, are represented in the same way with sort of quantities here, uh, summary and then, and then the plan. So from the Roman city um, to, for example, the sort of panoptic um, idealized um, at the city the first attempt at Hosman, <coughs> which is a is always described as this, these cuts in, in Paris, uh, but they're quite interesting in that they weren't uh, just about controlling uh, population, but they were also an amazing new infrastructural piece of, of sewage, etc. 
uh, the Cité Industrielle, the beginning uh, of industrialization around 1917, um, still very much connected to energy and resources. The whole organization of the city uh, is, is, is placed in a way that it harnesses the dam um, that it's next to and it's or, or oriented so that the winds don't uh, sort of carry the uh, industrial um, sort of pollution into the habitation, etc. Of course, uh, you know, modernism, Corbusier's uh, radiant city, uh, zoning, order, the grid, <coughs> and then its counterpart later on with the Smith and, and ten, uh, Team 10, uh, who uh, sort of wanting to escape this kind of thinking about the city of one that is zoned, uh, layer it, and look more at infrastructure to create fabric. Um, the notion of infrastructure becoming city also carried through projects like um, Bridge City, um, um, Yona Friedman's kind of, uh, uh, bridge over the channel and then came uh, France to England um, where you plug in sort of housing and, and commercial activity on this bridge. Um, and um, of course the metabolists um, who uh, sort of look at density and compression and still engage in a, in a sort of relationship to the natural, um, whether real or just kind of visual and or conceptual. And finally, new attempts like um, where the notion of, you know, where new cities today are uh, popping up and some of them are being thought as um, uh, uh, sort of one of development uh, that can be sort of master plan. This is uh, Fonster's Mazda, one of the first um, attempts at the kind of zero uh, carbon city. <coughs> All of the cities, um, and density was a big um, uh, density is obviously one of the, well, not obviously, but it was one of the uh, sort of aspect we were looking at. And so we really uh, sort of evaluated the various cities um, as they followed the density. And interestingly enough, Archigram's uh, plug-in city um, is one of the highest densities. And it's very interesting because Archigram is in our 49 cities, kind of Jake Jacobs, uh, uh, no zoning, mixing, all about street life, but uh, within a mega structure. And of course, the dome over Manhattan is one of the uh, densest, uh, which is also interesting. Thank you. Uh, in that um, it just says that existing cities uh, <laughs> <laughs> existing cities are already amazing, uh, are often already amazing dense, and all you need is sort of uh, preserve that density and. and, 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 and create a system of it um, instead of always projecting and using We thought Solari would be uh, uh, amazingly dense. Uh, if you read his book, uh, it's all about <coughs> miniaturize or die. Well, Solari, his uh, forms are quite organic, but uh, in fact, his cities are quite inflated and, and, and black density, which was very surprising to us. Um, Fuller, on the other hand, uh, goes the opposite way, which is all about compression. This is this 100-story uh, pyramid. Um, you cannot get denser than that. And we looked at NPR. Uh, so Larry makes up in NPR, but um, um, this is another project in SFC, um, which um, uh, in, in the ways uh, that he does it in density. We looked at population, and that, that too is quite interesting. This is <coughs> Tokyo Bay. Because of the Tokyo project, um, uh, five million people that have been expanded to ten million. And if you compare uh, Tokyo Bay to, uh, which is <coughs> on your left, to Hilbert Zimmer's Chicago plant, uh, which was all about um, sort of dispersing Chicago into the suburbs, um, mainly for well for two reasons: one was for wind, but the other was to actually, uh, as you know. One of the suburbia's function was to 
to avoid uh, massive um, uh, amounts of death in case of bombing. Uh, so this, it's very, um, it's the same population in both plants and it speaks for itself. This is Mesa City compared to Radian City. Uh, also interesting to look at this scale. Um, you know, to look at the scale when you think of Soleri as the ecologist and uh, Corbusy thought of as um, always the kind of modern, modernist against nature. Um, finally, and maybe more important for us um, is, well, this is a very generic term, open space, but more importantly is the kind of continuous study of the relationship between the urban and the rural uh, throughout all of these um, kind of utopias. Um, from Fourier's Fallonster, which is all about this kind of new um, social, uh, social community of farmers and, and, and as well as um, sort of light industry um, where you know, everything is integrated within this community and really this um, uh, the building which you see here um, uh, it occupies, uh, uh, I think, 5,000 acres around it. Uh, Garden City, of course, um, Howard's proposal um, is again um, compressing living uh, into these circles. You can't expand the circle, really. I mean, you could, um, but in his case, you could you would start a new one. And in between all of these Garden Cities, you would have agricultural land. <coughs> Very close by. Um, Rodiger City, of course, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's plan is, is entirely based on, even ideologically, you know, moving back to, to nature and uh, for the American lifestyle to uh, embrace again uh, its kind of rural roots. <coughs> At the time of Rodiger City, the entire population of the US could fit in Texas. So the notion of density was not so important. And <coughs> for us, um, Radiant City is also about uh, the green city. Um, and not so much uh, the, the kind of office in the park, which is was, uh, sort of, which became represented as, um, especially if you read uh, um, Suburban Nation, the brother, <coughs> If you reread the commentary, it's really the city in wilderness, kind of minimal impact, and leaving uh, <coughs> nature as it is. Um, this is one of his quote. This is uh, what the open spaces of our great cities might be like. So our rereading of the commentary is one of wilderness rather than long. And his sketches through that light sort of take on a very different aspect. Um, Le Corbusier also had, interestingly, uh, uh, a whole plan of urban farming <coughs> where individual residents would not only have uh, sort of suspended gardens um, next to their houses, as you can see in the elevation, but would have potager, which is a, a kind of productive garden. Uh, each one would have 150 square meters of, uh, of um, productive garden, and then for every hundred lots, you would have a farmer. So that was, um, so the notion that, um, you know, Radiant City is opposed to Radiant City, if you look at it from uh, this sort of relationship um, that is sought, uh, thought and sought between uh, the urban and the rural is, is it makes them, it brings them closer together. And so we also like to move beyond the kind of traditional opposition of the Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright. But one of the, the sort of um, fascinating issues in this sort of trajectory um, is that, of course, it, it sort of dies out, um, uh, but not so much to the 70s only. I mean, really, the, what, what is projected sort of changes. So Larry kept uh, and really tried to build his utopia. This is Arthur <coughs> Fuller, who really had a larger vision for the world, uh, resulted more uh, in being appropriated by um, sort of um, counterculture that would actually escape the city and try to build sort of integrate houses within nature. So, you know, this kind of miniaturization of those ideas 
Um, and and Arthur Graham, uh, he recently interviewed Michael Webb, and you know, and he explained how he really went, they really went from the kind of mega structural to being more and more fascinated, um, since they were just fascinated with mobility technology. <coughs> Architecture almost disappeared uh, uh, in their search. And what's interesting is that all of this life, and there's n nowhere I thought of where is this life coming from, what are the systems that sustain them, sustain it uh, uh, underground, or, or it's, it's just this plug in city, but what are you plugging into, uh, and where does that come from? Uh, and so these are the kind of questions that we, I think, are, are relevant for today. Uh, I don't think it's um, I think we can project that we can't, we don't have the same uh, ability to just uh, uh, believe that um, uh, something comes from nowhere and when we throw it out, it goes somewhere that we don't care. It's, everything is coming back. And so, <coughs> as these kind of uh, visionary plans develop, um, the, this notion of really looking at the urban and the rural disappears. With Archigram, it really disappears. Uh, Archizoom is a kind of critique. They, they're sort of in between uh, Archigram and Super Studio, where it's really about the critical and kind of radical position uh, 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 that not at all uh, so much about projecting or engaging. Uh, and the latest, uh, last manifesto we might have um, is maybe the, the Urbanist Manifesto for the City, uh, but which is also quite <coughs> limiting, we think. Uh, and <clears throat> does not engage these larger issues that we think are really relevant and interesting. Um, and this idea, this was uh, for a site 
which is a kind of site to site. When we got there, not only we, we thought the shopping mall was already there, it turned out the shopping mall wasn't there. Uh, the city, the town around the shopping mall was being built, and really there was absolutely no there there. It was an old, uh, had been an orange grove, and it was being turned into suburbs. It was like three hours from LA, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And so the idea was to kind of jolt these, uh, whoever was going to be living under this illusion that they were living somewhere, kind of jolt them out of their day-to-day -day suburban existence and make them maybe think a little bit more about the relationship between place and space. Uh, so this, on the outside, these kind of vines have now grown over this, uh, so that the beige of the, the, the continuous beige of the shopping mall, uh, in a way, disappears at this store under this uh, screen of green, uh, which becomes denser at the entrance. And then within the store, uh, the very first thing you encounter is a small piece of the outdoors inserted within the shopping mall. So this is an orange tree uh, growing. It, it rains in there when it rains. Uh, and there's absolutely no shopping, so it's a kind of anti-shopping moment uh, as soon as you come in the store. Similarly, in our project for uh, Diane von Furstenberg, a kind of fashion icon in New York City, uh, the relationship was, with nature was perhaps even less explicit, uh, but no less important. So uh, this was a project we built, a new six-story building uh, behind these two landmark facades, uh, which organized her, uh, her company and her uh, privatized into a kind of seamless six-story hole, going from her flagship store on the ground floor through the storeroom, uh, offices for production and design, uh, her own private uh, atelier, and then actually her apartment at the top. And to link all of these, we created what we call the stair de lire, which is a stair and a chandelier that kind of cuts through the, through the project. What was most important, though, was the idea that the stair de lire could also perform uh, to actually bring light into what was otherwise going to be very dark, uh, deep, kind of uh, 19th century uh, facades. And so uh, the stairway emerges at this kind of diamond penthouse at the top. And in that diamond penthouse, we have a series of heliostatic mirrors, one of which is constantly tracking the sun and calculating the difference between the stair angle and the sun angle, uh, reflecting it onto fixed mirrors that then beam it down to the stair, onto tertiary mirrors, uh, which reflect it onto these kind of uh, crystals which line the stair. So that um, throughout the day, you have natural light coming uh, no matter where the sun is, uh, as long as the sun is out. And so this is the stair of the One interesting thing is you enter the building and you immediately see the sky. Uh, so similar to anthropology where you're confronted with nature, uh, here you kind of are immediately looking at the sky even though you just entered this very tall building. Um, and that stair kind of cuts through creating public space uh, and shared spaces throughout and also blurring the distinction between, say, the spaces of production and the spaces of consumption. So here you see uh, the showroom where the buyers come is kind of visually connected uh, to the spaces of production up above. So, and, and the stair becomes this connected element uh, and in social space as well. Uh, here are the heliostat mirrors. Uh, so this is the, the tracking one, and those are the fixed ones. And then here you see the tertiary mirrors that move it onto the stair. It's kind of an amazing light. Obviously, light is very important to fashion designers so that the clothes look the way that they will look outdoors. Uh, but it, and it, it's, it's very natural. So that if a cloud, for example, goes over the, the sun, the entire building dims and comes back up in a very natural, live way. So even though you might be not aware of nature or the technology, uh, somehow just being in the building gives you a very almost disconcerting uh, sense of, of not knowing the, the, whether you're inside or outside or up or down. Uh, and here at the top, uh, there is a small patch of nature at the very top. We have a green roof, uh, an integrated geothermal heating and cooling, etc. That's the, the top of the, uh, that's her private apartment as well. Yes, thank you for the time. <coughs> green space or, or the this idea that you can really integrate landscape uh, within, within architectural um, buildings. These are a series of uh, competitions. This was um, for a competition for a, a back in Reykjavik. Um, and the idea was that the building would just create a sort of topography uh, almost mirroring or, or a complement to the, to the park next to it, and creating just a series of terraces. Um, um, from the street level and the kind of roof of the building would actually be public uh, as opposed to the interior of the building. In another very different context, uh, look, looking at kind of more local topologies, uh, this is a competition for a, a 
cultural center in Beirut. And in this case, we really took the <coughs> idea of balconies <coughs> and courtyards uh, and dispersed them uh, throughout the, the building um, to create these kind of co connected open spaces and vertical gardens throughout the building. As you can see um, here, every time there's a pool, it's a kind of outdoor space, a meeting space, and a green space <coughs> with varying landscape as you move up. <coughs> And the facade that um, actually uh, distant uh, has a gap um, from the uh, forms of the various uh, um, uh, performance halls and so on, etc., to allow for vertical uh, uh, green to grow in between and, and invade the, the building. <coughs> this is uh, another attempt, again, a completely different <coughs> context with a very different uh, environment and a different landscape. Um, this is Ordos in Inner Mongolia, where a hundred uh, firms were invited to design a, uh, a villa each. And the weather is quite harsh in Inner Mongolia, so in this case, all of the openings uh, are really to the sky, uh, not so much to the, uh, to the periphery, uh, and uh, uh, creating a lot of kind of vertical connections uh, in contrast with the facade. Uh, that's much more closed and opaque and walled and thick. Um, here you see, again, these openings and these courtyards um, at the top. So we sort of actively integrate um, um, the kind of outside um, and the inside. Um, finally, this is a, a project we're working on right now. Um, it's very hard to do new construction in New York. So DBF was a sort of interior, an entire behind facades. This is a thickened facade wrapping around an existing building. Um, the black uh, sort of slab is a one-story library in Queens, and we're, um, uh, to expand it, uh, we're wrapping it um, basically uh, with a kind of 15-foot uh, building in front. Uh, and the idea was to sort of create a green belt to carry the sort of garden that they had in the back and, and create a uh, sort of loop around the building that um, uh, would sort of uh, allow for a sense of monumentality even for this uh, relatively small building, uh, where as the as kind of band uh, uh, moves up and down, uh, it announces the entrance and the, uh, and the institution, uh, whereas it comes down to uh, reveal the, the kind of uh, green roof um, and, and hide the kind of staff areas underneath. Uh, and here you see the kind of <coughs> other side, uh, which is the kids' area. So the whole roof is articulated, uh, where it's sometimes building, sometimes just roof. Uh, the next uh, issue, which is really important to us, is uh, this uh, idea of appropriating infrastructure, or utilizing infrastructure, and particularly urban infrastructure, uh, as an opportunity uh, to create public space or to or to create uh, shared uh, facilities uh, that infrastructure in itself uh, can be combined and reutilized to create new experiences and new, uh, new types of spaces. So a few projects that address this particular issue, I'm not sure how this one does, but uh, it does somewhere. Uh, this is uh, Akureyri in Iceland, which is Iceland's uh, second largest city. Uh, of course, Iceland's first largest city has like 150,000 people in it, so its second largest city, you can imagine, has very few. And uh, in fact, it's losing people. So it's a, a shrinking city as everyone moves to Reykjavik in the south. Uh, the idea was how can we kind of bring people back uh, or, or entice people to move to this uh, small town in the north. So uh, our idea was to, uh, and in a way, uh, utilize the city itself as infrastructure or parts of the city that had not been thought of as infrastructure uh, to create, instead of a town with one very small center, uh, to create a town with multiple centers. Uh, obviously in Houston, you know a lot about multiple centers. Um, so we kind of looked and, uh, and appropriated several areas uh, of potential infrastructural intervention. Um, here you see the kind of existing town center. Uh, this was the port area where the port was in the process of moving out of town, opening up a number of warehouse buildings and, and different uh, types of structures. This is a botanical garden here. Uh, 
This one is a botanical garden, uh, which seems to kind of have some kind of energy. And this was a shopping mall. It's like a three minute walk from downtown, but everyone was afraid it was stealing uh, the aura of the city. So we simply said we would appropriate it. Uh, and then so through kind of industrial uh, area, a retail area, and a natural area to create a kind of series of new themed centers, uh, which we then connected in a number of ways to create what we call the agrarian loop. So in a way, connecting all of those centers with a continuous loop of programs, so new housing typologies, uh, new types of green spaces, uh, and environmentally uh, sensitive uh, uh, technology, such as wind technology, uh, new housing, and uh, a kind of series of, of gardens, all connected through a space that, this is like a big sports town, so there's also a kind of sports loop uh, where you could, you know, if you were had a big backpack, you could kind of ice skate and then jog and then swim and then uh, rollerblade and then uh, windsurf and then, I uh, don't basically around the loop. Uh, the second project, which does this in more blatant way, is the Greenbelt City of Las Vegas. Here we were charged with developing uh, 15,000 new residential units in Las Vegas with no casino, uh, which was nice. Uh, but still, we were a little bit mystified because Las Vegas for us is a kind of huge waste of water on one hand and uh, kind of endless construction and deconstruction on the other hand. So this was our site, this kind of pink area, uh, in this, within this kind of series of bands, bounded by the highway on one side uh, and a residential neighborhood on the other. On the other side of the highway uh, is the strip here. You can see all the big casinos. Between the highway and the strip are kind of zone of warehouses uh, where they store all of the showgirls' uniforms, I guess. So uh, this was our condition. And this was our program. It's very simple, 15,000 uh, square feet of uh, 15,000 residential units means 15 million square feet of housing in Las Vegas that required 7 million square feet of parking. And then the developer allowed us to introduce 1 million square feet of whatever we wanted, uh, as long as it had a school, because in exchange for building a school, uh, the city of Las Vegas allowed them to go as high as they wanted, as long as airplanes wouldn't hit it. So that was the deal. Uh, and then a series of other cultural parts. So we started with that parking. 7 million square feet of parking is a lot, but we figured we'll just, in Las Vegas, you can't dig underground. It's too expensive. The water table is ironically high in Las Vegas. Uh, so you can't dig underground. So all parking in Las Vegas is surface parking, uh, which is like gum in the subway. Like once you notice it, you can't stop seeing it. So if you go to Las Vegas, you'll see like there's a lot of parking, a lot of ground. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's true. Um, and I guess you can go So this is, uh, but if we covered the entire site, it would have been a 35-acre four-story garden garage, which we thought was a little extreme. Then we thought we could just buffer the highway, uh, but that was a 40-story parking tower, which also seemed a little bit extreme. So what we proposed was to kind of utilize that parking as a kind of urban infrastructure uh, and kind of combine those two, uh, two ways of looking at it. So create a kind of endless loop of parking that goes from seven or eight stories to form that buffer along the highway side down to three or four stories where it intersects with the, the rural, the, uh, the residential neighborhood. And that loop of parking uh, then could double up as public space because in Las Vegas, the one thing you also know about parking is that you can never count the top floor as parking space because no one is ever going to park on the top floor of a parking garage in Las Vegas. Uh, it's just simply too hot. So that top floor was a simple essentially available, which we proposed to turn into a public park. We calculated that by simply using the gray water from the 15,000 residential units, we can actually filter it through a living machine, forming a kind of green buffer along the parking garage space, which would then create enough clean water to water all of the plants in perpetuity. So if the developer simply paid for the plants in the path, uh, it would kind of maintain itself simply through the day-to-day -day functioning of the, of the uh, of the 15,000 units, and that could be this kind of interesting public space where the public would be on this uh, seven stories above looking at the strip and kind of in an interesting position looking down on all the rich people. We call this also that. <laughs> so then the towers, there's 19 towers, they run from 45 to 85 stories, and what we wanted to do was create these what we call super towers. So the super towers uh, not only become the most icon iconic emblem of this new residential development, but they're also, each tower is uh, within each of these three zones.
zones is the ecological infrastructure for each of the zones. So that the towers themselves splay out so that the one south face can have uh, photovoltaic panels. Within the splay, then we can utilize the space for uh, a kind of co-generation plants, electric car, charging stations, and the first and second uh, phases of the water uh, reclamation project. Uh, and then each one had a big fan at the top. So that the image of the project is the infrastructure. Uh, the, the, the biggest, most luxurious towers, let's say, are also the most functional and the most uh, plebeian. Uh, so here you see the three super towers with its, uh, their kind of uh, less functioning neighbors. Uh, there, and then the uh, third phase of the water treatment is forming this kind of marshland uh, along the parking garage space with the park on top of it. Uh, the last project is uh, within this idea of infrastructure is uh, the public farm one, the, our proposal for MOMA's PS1. Normally, uh, there are three program elements for this project. Uh, you have to provide shade, you have to provide seating, and there has to be water somewhere in. And so we said uh, that it was interesting, but we also wanted to utilize this competition where you know, essentially anything goes, it's all up to you. Uh, you end up paying for it, so I guess you know, that's part of it. Uh, you're paying for it, you might as well do whatever you want. So we thought, let's uh, really investigate the idea of the city and see if we can build uh, a kind of new piece of urban infrastructure for the city. And so this is the, the project here. It's a kind of folded plane uh, within the courtyards that creates a number of different spaces in section and in plan, uh, so that this is the high piece, uh, the two high ends, which create very high spaces that come down to the ground in the middle to save weight uh, and create these lower spaces. The entire thing was built, as Troy mentioned, out of uh, cardboard tubes, so the kind of ubiquitous everyday uh, tube which is used to pour concrete columns, uh, are bolted together with this system. Uh, there's basically, we, we glued and screwed uh, two by fours to give bolts something to grab into, then the bolts bolt together the tubes. There's shelves, and they actually, the, the secret of the whole structure of it is these climbing shelves, uh, which give the cylinders rigidity in the, in the uh, Y dimension. So uh, the cylinder obviously is very, very strong uh, in kind of uh, ver vertical strength, but this gives it strength uh, from collapsing in and on itself, which then holds up the plants. Uh, there's irrigation that's run through and then a little hole for, for drinking the water out as the plants grow. Uh, so it was a fully functioning quarter acre uh, urban farm, uh, which we planted with 52 varieties of fruits and vegetables that were timed to bloom and produce at different points during the summer. Uh, all the vegetables were used either in the cafeteria uh, or the, uh, for the staff or for our staff. Uh, so basically cutting down food miles from uh, an average of 1,500 miles to about 150 feet. Uh, and we also designed picking skirts for everyone to wear. So the farm was the top and below was this kind of um, uh, party infrastructure. So this is the site for parties where up to 7,000 people come on the weekends. Uh, so we wanted to kind of really utilize the section, uh, since this was a piece of urban infrastructure, to prove in a way that you can have kind of a fully functioning urban farm with as much as possible uh, activity underneath it, to kind of doubling the landscape uh, the land at once. So we had uh, video and sound which kind of broadcast. We wanted to have farm animals there, uh, and so this brought them in virtually. We had video and kind of cows would moo and pigs would point uh, occasionally as you're at the party we had it. A uh, uh, phone charging station, which was powered by solar power, a kind of place for plants and seating, a kids' area with a little periscope, etc. The whole thing was off grid, so this was a fully functioning off grid system. We rigged up all of the roofs of the PS1 museum uh, to a big cistern and then uh, had a series of solar panels which pumped the water up to use drip irrigation, which is a very efficient way of watering the plants. And those solar panels also powered things like the juicing machine for the cocktails and, and the solar power uh, and the, map, the sounds and the uh, video and, and the phone charger. So this is what it looked like uh, from above. So you see the, the, the working farm. This structural unit of six tubes around an empty tube also became the planting unit. So it's kind of the, the pattern of the structure is repeated. Here you see the underside uh, and you can see uh, the infrastructure of the drip irrigation system. Uh, and the, the, the plants in, the, in their little bags. Here's a, one of the urban farmers with her picking skirt picking. Uh, you can see the kind of scale of things, so it went up to 40 feet at its highest point. Uh, it's a lightweight material, but we were supporting about 80,000 pounds of 
uh, plants and soil, uh, all through cardboard structure. And here is a view from the inside where really urban farm and urban life kind of meet each other. Uh, we did manage, we didn't tell Momo we were doing this, but we did bring chickens there. Uh, so we had uh, eggs also all summer long. Uh, we just kind of put them in under the solar panels. We told them we were building a solar shed, but it turned out to be a chicken coop. And then let it out to the So these guys were out most of the time, and then on Saturdays, obviously, we put them away uh, in their coop so that the party could, could go on, which you see here. Uh, so this is the uh, scaling up. Um, was our entry for uh, Hudson Yards, which we collaborated with Bavari Architects um, with. And uh, Hudson Yards, um, the competition was for a park uh, on an existing uh, a railway track, which we had to bridge over, existing parking, uh, um, and sort of uh, various uh, traffic infrastructure of the city. Uh, so really, uh, the whole park was already a bridge, and uh, it was very obvious that um, by simply uh, manipulating the height of the, ele the elevation of the structure, um, you could create a, a topography uh, uh, at the same cost. Uh, and in fact, uh, a med program, a public program underneath. So sort of contrary to uh, making the park really just a roof, uh, different from Central Park, which is a topography that is all the way solid. Um, and the idea was also to uh, actually try to bring back uh, wildlife into Manhattan. Uh, and working with Fritz Haig, um, we identified a number of species um, that um, could really live within this context, including salamanders uh, and, and frogs. And so the whole thing uh, really becomes a, a kind of new uh, ecosystem uh, that's neither totally urban nor uh, totally rural, but uh, a merging of the two. Um, this is our very sophisticated model, uh, <laughs> showing the topography uh, and <coughs> sort of moving block by block. Uh, the landscape, uh, the landscaping will change uh, with uh, sort of crop areas as well as playgrounds, barbecue areas, etc. So some uh, suburban programming within the city to a certain extent. Uh, but the idea was that the whole, the park would also act in terms of water infrastructure um, and uh, all of the water from the uh, adjacent roofs uh, of buildings would be uh, collected uh, to sustain this, this park and, and cleaned through the park. And um, the intent was to make this water infrastructure really visible. Uh, um, so, have, uh, so the kind of merging of traffic infrastructure and water infrastructure rather than hiding the kind of sewage uh, underground is uh, almost exposing it uh, and using these tubes to create um, everything from the seating uh, to canopies um, to areas for the kids to, to play um, and then all of the water would culminate um, in this sort of uh, big um, water collector um, at the end, uh, again a kind of marker uh, within this horizontal uh, landscape. Here you see the, the kind of particular uh, crop and, and, and pond uh, uh, in one of the kind of blocks. Each block is supposed to be different. Um, looking, sort of taking these sort of horizontal ideas but uh, stacking them vertically uh, is a, another idea, uh, not so much competition but proposal for uh, a building in, uh, in Greenwich South, which is sort of north of. Uh, the World Trade Center site. Um, and we were asked to just, um, again, propose a kind of new uh, building type um, for Manhattan, new living um, type. And so um, we've always been fascinated by the idea that uh, a building could not only provide housing, uh, but also provide infrastructure for, uh, for a neighborhood. And so we pro uh, proposed a plug out tower uh, which sort of uh, is like a Swiss knife, um, where various types of housing are stacked, uh, including uh, kind of an unité, uh, garden city housing, uh, Brooklyn brownstones, sort of bringing Brooklyn back to Manhattan, uh, um, courtyard housing and the, and the school at the top, and they sort of fan out to follow the sun, um, so you can really grow um, 
fluid on their roofs. Um, and here you see it sort of occupy uh, the site as it goes up. Um, and the plaga uh, would also work through its core rather than just providing circulation. Uh, the core would provide a series of um, sort of uh, uh, collective spaces for the inhabitants, but also potentially public spaces um, as a, uh, for the neighborhood as a kind of added value uh, and result of <coughs> the infrastructure. So um, <coughs> we had a, a hydroponics, we had a fish farm. Uh, um, so the water systems would go down. Uh, here you see the, the fish farm and the laundry, um, the laundry, the fish farm, uh, and kind of water planting <coughs> to go down. And then moving up uh, would be uh, the, the heat would move up from uh, composting, uh, uh, which would create a kind of heated move for outdoor camping on uh, one of the uh, kind of roofs of the of the uh, buildings and the family at the top of the school. So the whole core was inflated to also provide uh, systems and infrastructure which uh, um, using temperature would also uh, uh, generate a sauna, camping grounds, uh, etc., etc. So uh, programs that are the pool that are uh, connected with heat and cool and uh, water and um, green space. And this is a view of the plug out um, from uh, the river and the timber of Manhattan. Finally, completely zooming down uh, in scale uh, is uh, our entry for the <coughs> Chen Chen Biennale, uh, the Hong Kong Biennale, which is going to happen in 2011, um, which we call the Aqua Loop. And here, uh, the idea there's an interesting relationship between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Shenzhen is really the serving um, city. Uh, and um, one of the services is uh, a lot of fish farms exist in Shenzhen. So we're composing this kind of um, public outdoor sculpture, uh, which will be a, a fish farm, uh, and as well as a, a kind of a sushi place where the fish would be cut up, a kind of restaurant, and a massage uh, parlor all together, as well as a playground, uh, so connected in a group. Uh, and so um, here you see and the kind of massage area, the restaurant, uh, uh, well, it's a sort of cafe with the, uh, the chefs with chopping up um, the fish. And it's really the idea of a closed system uh, as fish farms function, uh, uh, which is um, they um, sort of provide the fertilizer uh, um, um, uh, to the four plants, and then the plants provide them food, and so it's this kind of endless system. And in this case, even more uh, sort of closed, where you introduce human activity uh, through food uh, uh, and so sort of consuming the fish and then providing food for them again. And here's the, the kind of uh, I, uh, sort of proposal. We're still looking at how to build it. This should be ten. All right. The last issue is this. Uh, we kind of mentioned it at the, at the forefront of the talk, this idea of what is the appropriate scale of intervention. Uh, is it Robert Moses? Is it Jane Jacobs? And uh, I'm sure the project for that was really explicit. This is the uh, competition we recently won in Shenzhen uh, for Hua Chang Bay. Hua Chang Bay is the kind of electronic shopping street. And it's, uh, it used to be a very industrial area. The street is uh, literally 300 feet wide. It's like one of the most incredible streets. Uh, it's also, I think, millions and millions of people who come there on the weekends to uh, buy electronics. So it's this kind of naturally occurring uh, place that it was never meant to be uh, what it has become. And so uh, that has the Chinese government kind of freaked out. And uh, they are very worried about the traffic and the, as you can see, uh, people waiting for the bus essentially just wait in the middle of the street, which means that only one bus can get through at a time, et cetera, et cetera. So they held this competition. And this was the kind of sketch that they gave us, uh, which was this kind of completely over-the-top reaction, uh, whereby the, the pink buildings are the existing buildings on either side of the street. They were asking us to kind of meet, uh, meditate on the idea of putting new buildings in the middle of the street, kind of isolating the traffic. There would be bridges continuously for a kilometer long along the street, which also would have bridges connecting to all the buildings and also bridges connecting across the street, and also would underground connect the three new subway lines, the 
the four new subway lines all together, one running parallel with the street and three perpendicular uh, all along the one kilometer length. So a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, slight overreaction uh, to the problem. They invited, uh, I think 12 architects were invited. They were hoping each would kind of give a variation on the theme of this, uh, but interestingly, none of them, none of us uh, kind of took them up at their, uh, with their proposal, and everyone proposed other things. So our kind of first thing was uh, the idea that the street is actually fine, uh, and that maybe bridges are a good idea, but bridges right at your head are not a good idea. So one uh, was to lift the, uh, the kind of area of cro street crossing as high as possible to kind of get sunlight uh, and, and activity below and really you know, maintain connectivity between one side of the street and the other. And the second was to take this brief of this kilometer long uh, building and, uh, and kind of bend it up into a series of kind of point interventions. So we called it uh, urban acupuncture, hoping that would sound Chinese enough for them. Uh, so this idea that basically it would kind of fold up uh, we would provide the same amount of program, but really concentrated in these series of points, uh, which become what we call these uh, six lanterns. We later reduced it to five uh, in an attempt to really win it. Um, and here you see this, the, the six interventions. Each one is connected underground uh, to all the subways, so you can kind of walk underground to connect all the subways. They come up, each one is also a kind of bridge, so you can go up. Uh, over and across uh, fairly easily, and each one creates a new public space, uh, type of public space. At first we had proposed really private spaces, stores and museums and things like that, stores and kind of electronic spaces, uh, and in the second round of the competition we were really encouraged to think of these as truly public spaces. So one becomes a park, uh, one becomes a swimming pool, one becomes a kind of a free public museum, uh, a kind of information stand, this is very important to them, where if you feel like you've been ripped off, you can go and talk to someone, show them your receipt, uh, so we have one of those. Uh, and then underneath these kind of larger public programs. So here's a view of the street, and we kind of zoom in, we worked on this project with Balmori Associates, landscape architects. So it's a point uh, intervention at every scale, so the big points of the, of the uh, street crossings and the new public programs, but then within the street itself, it's also this kind of pointless approach uh, where trees are along a grid, and then new seating and bus stops are all integrated uh, within this grid, maintaining as much as possible the existing uh, street width and the street life, and simply kind of cleaning it up, organizing it, uh, giving it a kind of a level of design that it doesn't have today. And then underground, connecting everything first to the sky, so you can easily kind of get down under and up if you don't want to use the bridges. And then this kind of uh, public promenade at the underground level, which actually links uh, a kind of eating hall, uh, a, a new huge public library, uh, a series of theaters, and other kind of bigger uh, programs which are all under the street. Uh, each, of the, uh, each of the five points also is a kind of ecological infrastructure, so one focuses on water, water one focuses on energy, a couple of them uh, provide productive gardens, etc. So they're also uh, a kind of teaching tool, let's say, for, for what the, the future uh, city could become. Uh, and here you see the, the kind of S-shaped bridge, which is this public park up isolated in the sky above uh, and you're connected to the ground. Uh, this is one of the museum programs, etc. Uh, at a totally different scale, it's one of our most exciting projects. This is uh, with the Chef Alice Waters uh, from San Francisco. This is an edible schoolyard. I'll go very quickly through it. It's uh, basically the idea is that kids work in the farm and then uh, in the field uh, for half the class and then they learn how to cook and to socialize. All the cooking is tied in the lesson plan, so if they're studying history, they're cooking old food, I guess, uh, mathematics, etc. And so uh, this is a kind of urban. We wanted to make sure it had uh, presence all year long when the kids are obviously in school during the winter months, and so this is still New York City. And so we talked with Elliot Coleman, who's a real innovator in farming from Maine. He has a four season farm in Maine, which all works on the principle of the moving greenhouse. And so we proposed, we didn't have as much space as he has on his farm. We proposed a moving greenhouse, which actually uh, exists in the spring and summer over the roof of the kitchen classroom, and then in the winter is pulled out in a kind of ceremony for the kids uh, over the soil to create an outdoor, uh, I mean a soil to soil greenhouse uh, during the winter months. And so during the summer it's like this, uh, and in the winter kind of this kind of green oasis uh, in the middle of the city. And the project is, we call it the Russian doll project because it has the greenhouse, the kitchen classroom, 
And then a third element, which are the systems. Uh, the systems too, is kind of referencing PS1 for us, uh, is everything from a tool shed, the solar batteries that will be an all off grid project. Again, composting <coughs> used to heat the water. That's the first time that'll be done, probably won't work. Uh, a cistern for collecting water for, for the things, and the, and the chicken coop uh, where the eggs can be taken right from the kitchen side. And that's a view of that. The last project we're going to show is this video, uh, which we made in China. It's very funny. But it's a kind of idea that we're working on uh, for a new book or something, uh, really about the idea of uh, you know, what the future, not only of cities, but uh, the kind of look, trying to take a broader look at the relationship between cities and specifically uh, the suburbs and, and the rural areas, uh, how food is produced, and how uh, cities and countryside can work together. We thought that really it's important to go back. I guess Ebenezer Howard's famous diagram of the three magnets. For him, the town uh, was a very poor place uh, with kind of pollution and density and sadness. Uh, for him, the countryside was also very sad because people had no social uh, opportunities. There were no cultural opportunities, also very poor. So he said the people, where would they go? And he kind of was the first to codify and propose this idea that, well, we don't have to live in the town or the country. We can live in this thing called the town country, uh, which is the, the, the third magnet. Uh, we looked and to see what that has become today. So obviously today the urban is maybe doing okay, but obviously has been underfunded and under uh, utilized for, for many years, dating back to the days of urban renewal. The rural areas have been become kind of this major source of pollution. Uh, industrial farming is kind of polluting the way that we eat and the water streams, uh, and really actually needs a complete reorganization. And then the third magnet, this town country, has become the suburbs, which is actually the worst of all three worlds. So you have the ugliness of the strip model, social dysfunction, the crystal meth uh, economy, etc. So we were thinking, what uh, is a possible future? And uh, perhaps for us, the most interesting uh, condition would be to simply uh, eliminate this idea that there is a third pole uh, and go back to a two-pole model, which is called the urban or the rural, uh, depending on which of us you're speaking of. I say verbal. Uh, where the urban and the countryside uh, are become kind of strengthened, and we just simply eliminate the suburbs, uh, with then suburbs becoming mini cities, uh, not then suburbs like where we did the agriculture store becoming farmland, and in a way, taking cues from either side and mixing, so that the urban becomes a little bit more local uh, through urban farming and a little bit of a greater connection to nature, uh, and then the rural becomes more organized, uh, you know, uh, looking at uh, small farm towns, etc., uh, trying to create this new system of food production. And so in combination with that, we recently did this video, uh, I think if it works, looking at the city of Newark and the relationship uh, with Manhattan. This video was entirely made in China to save money with our friends there. Uh, the guy reading is Chinese, and uh, we kind of let them go with it, so it's their music, etc. But anyway, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, here it goes. And jazz. The average American meal travels thousands of miles, from bark to plate, chemically fresh, and mostly caseless. But recently, the idea that more of our food should be grown organically and locally has taken hold. What would it take to create a 100-mile diet from New York City using organic farming? Industrial farming creates monocultures and pollutes water with pesticides. However, it requires only 11,273 square feet of land per person. To provide the same amount of food through organic farming, 22,801 square feet of agricultural area is required per person. That's a 60 mile radius around New York City. There are an additional 12.5 million people living in this region. Looking at the current available agricultural land, we would need at least 143 mile radius to feed all 20.5 billion people. How can we reduce this radiance? First, Americans can eat less. Here is the average American's diet. I eat calories and animal protein, which requires the most amount of land. We can eat more efficiently. The pyramid diet recommended by the USDA is lower in calories and makes a more intensive use of land. That's a 10% reduction in area 
to a radius of 137 miles. By reorganizing the suburbs and cities of the region surrounding New York City, we can increase the amount of agricultural land available and shrink the radius. This is a current map of surrounding counties of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. Red represents the most urban and dense, and green the most rural and unpopulated.
token and project example. But you want to find it through one example, through a project. Because somehow you, you, you work, you have a system, you involve certain things in your projects. But
Moses, and then you had urban renewal, all the disasters that happened. Jay Jacobs and William White stepped in and later the urbanists and kind of, and, uh, and architects get really nervous and scared and basically decide they're not going to do the big project anymore. And so while, you know, Jay Jacobs and William White have had this kind of 30-year run, at the same time there's been this enormous uh, revolution in the way that people live in America. The suburbs in the 50s were not bad. I mean, that's like, that's really simple stuff. But the suburbs that have happened since the 50s are really the density. Yeah, they're the density and, and the amount of agricultural land has been. So, you know, kind of while we were all sleeping, this was happening anyway. And similarly, with my color, at the same time, this kind of incredible revolution in how we eat. Food has always shaped cities. And now it's like the disconnect from food uh, has led to, you know, the, the, the food companies have grab all this power without anyone questioning it. You know, food and power was always related all the way back to the very beginning of the net. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's been this huge thing where all of a sudden there's like 10 companies that control all of food production and nobody even seems to care. So, I mean, what is kind of interesting? I think that the revolution that happened.